relies on drawing emotions from real life experiences to touch audiences. There's one experience in particular as a teenager in Chicago that became a huge source for her comedy. Let's see how Olivia overcame family tragedy and created a passion for performing for our troops in a segment we like to call For the Boys. That's for you, you know that. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, South Side. It was simple because everybody was more of a family type situation. But all the neighbors, uh, you, you go to the store, <clears throat> you do something wrong, the neighbors are telling on you. You know, so it was kind of like a village raising the, the, the kids. But it was easier for us because, uh, you know, so my father was a police officer in our neighborhood, so we got a lot more respect. But bottom line is, kids are gonna do what they're gonna do. They're gonna go to gangs. I'll tell you what, in Chicago, we had tough gangs. The Culver Stones, the Rangers. Houston, where I live, they pick inside of town. That's the name of the game. East side, west side. <laughs> Even the homeless ones, outside. Uh, it, it was just unsaid, but you did what they said. It was easier to do what they said than to find out what's coming. If you, you could be outside, I mean, anywhere, and. You know, like I said, when your, your dad's a cop in the neighborhood, he, he could pop up at any time. And if, if he doesn't see you, one of his boys are gonna see you. So it was just easier to, to stay in line. But, I mean, we had curfews and all that, and, and we, we respected him. Yeah, that was a day when you couldn't dial 911. They just, and then if you call the police, who's coming? <laughs> your dad's friends. A cool part was, though, if somebody did mess with you, you could go home and describe him to your father and He'd bring them back to the house and uh, bring them to the backyard and explain to them how you're his child and proceed to do what he had to do and then, <laughs> then send them home. <laughs> so we didn't even need to send them down to the station. He took care of them. My dad arrested two guys. It was like malicious mischief or whatever. They were out after my dad. And this particular night, uh, weekend, my aunt and uncle had come down from St. Louis. Uh, they brought their two kids with them. Uh, they were out late, you know, with, with my dad. Um, and they came in probably like 2, 3 in the morning, something like that. And um, my cousin was in the back in the room with us, and he was crying. He was about 15 months old. And my aunt came and took him to the room with her. They were in my parents' room. My parents gave him their room. My parents were sleeping on the sofa. They let the, the bed out on the sofa. Um, Next thing, I, I, it's like four in the morning, I hear all this screaming, uh, you know, oh my God, you know, what is this? You know, what's going on? I run into the kitchen and we had this big mirror in the living room and, and I looked at it, it was just completely orange. And uh, those were the flames coming from a Molotov cocktail that had been thrown through my parents' bedroom uh, window. And uh, apparently when the bottle of Coke uh, filled with gas came through, the gas spilled on my uncle. And uh, I remember standing in the kitchen, I was about 13 maybe. My uncle ran by me um, and he was he was in flames. Uh, his clothes were on fire. And he still, he ran into our bathroom. And uh, I stood there for a minute, frozen for a minute. And uh, I walked in and looked in the bathroom and he actually had a bucket. As badly as he was burned, he actually had a bucket trying to fill it up with water like he was going to go put this fire out. And I saw him, he, he filled it up and, I, and he turned the water off and he turned and then he just kind of fell to the floor and, and, and the bucket just fell uh, on the um, floor next to him. And to, to look at it, it's just like even the, the skin, everything was just coming, just like it was coming off. He died three days later, you know, and left behind a seven-year-old son and a 15-month-old son. And you see, I mean, when you, you can't ever get that out, that image uh, out of your head. I've learned one thing about life being so short. I've learned to love myself, and that's what y'all need to learn. The same thing as you are. You look at TV. TV is always trying to tell you how you should look. Am I right? Yeah. I can look at a slim fast commercial, I don't feel nothing. <laughs> I can look at that guy go in and out the sandwich shop, it don't make no difference to me. Because see, I'm from the hood. You lost 80 pounds in six weeks, use a crackhead. <laughs>
But you know those those stories, those those kind of things are the things that I draw on. And you may think it's weird when I go on stage. Now you kind of get in a little psyche to try to get ready, because comedy to me is not the word you're saying; it's the emotion you put behind the word you're saying. Sometimes that emotion is what other people need to feel. Wow, it's like she witnessed war firsthand. When we return, we're gonna find out how Olivia's experience helped her comedy career, and also how she's known as the female Bob Hope. Isn't Bob Hope white? We'll be right back.